Hi everyone, uh, welcome uh, to this webinar on the hot topic of battery immersion cooling. I am Arnaud Deron, CEO and founder of EXOS. And today I will welcome Dr. Cécile Perra to join me for this webinar. Cécile uh, has a lot of experience on powertrain and e powertrain and is director of Orovel uh, Limited. Hi, Cécile. So let's move directly to the agenda for this 40 minutes webinar, uh, which will be followed by a 20 minutes Q&A session. So Cecile will begin with uh, an introduction on the various types of battery cooling, and then I'm gonna uh, have a focus on immersion cooling, and in particular, we'll address the various topics. So types, different types of immersion cooling technologies, different types of fluids used for immersion cooling, the impact on the vehicle and the complete system, how to generate representative data, what are the data needed by OEMs today to take decisions to move to this technology for tomorrow, a brief presentation of EXOS and Immersive, the two companies I'm leading, and then the Q&A session. So please, for the Q&A session, you have a Q&A module uh, in, uh, in Zoom. Uh, please write your question in this module, and if one of the questions is the one you would like to ask, please feel free to vote for it. And the question that we have the most vote will be the one that will be treated in priority. Okay, so uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours, Cecile, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Cecile. I guess if you are here, you all know that battery cooling is super important. And the first thing probably you are thinking about is safety. We all know that battery cooling is important for security and to uh, avoid any problem like fire. So in the example I put here, you have a battery pack from an Audi e-tron. And this is what it looked like after a complete uh, fire event. So you can see it looked very bad and uh, everything has burned and uh, the heat release is very important for the reason that what burn and the heat release is not really what is electrically stored inside the battery, but is everything around this. So it means all uh, the plastic, all the polyurethane, all the binder of the cell are going to burn and they burn with a lot of oxygen because actually the battery cells uh, are oxide, so they contain a lot of oxygen and you understand a lot of flammable product with a lot of oxygen means a lot of heat release. So when it starts burning, it's very difficult for fire security to stop this fire and you want absolutely to avoid this. So to avoid this, you need to stop that before it happens. So you need this before you get runaway and thermal propagation. In order to do this, you need to be sure that at any time you have your heat dissipation superior to the heat transfer. And the possibility to do that, you have two um, uh, mechanisms to do that. You can use the BMS, so the battery management system, so the electronics, so you can control and uh, make sure the cells are doing well and you also can rely on the cooling uh, system of your battery. The second point for which uh, battery uh, cooling is very important is to constantly ensure that your battery stay within a very narrow range of temperature. So your battery is happy only when it stays in this narrow range of temperature, meaning that it will not degrade too much, you will ensure a maximum life cycle, and you will also ensure that you have the best performance in terms of capacity and power. If you go above this temperature range, you will end up to what we have just seen before. So you will get a problem like fire, so runaway, thermal propagation. But even before that, even if you start to uh, be in the range of 80 degrees, 100 degrees, you start decomposing uh, some of the elements of the cell. So you decompose the binder, you decompose all the um, uh, uh, separator and so on and you will lose uh, some mechanical stability, which means that you will degrade your battery, but you will also introduce problems like uh, diminishing the capacity of your battery or the power. Maybe paradoxically for some of you, if you are also too cold, you also start to degrade your battery because uh, chemistry works thanks to temperature. So when you start to become too cold, your lithium are not able to move freely. So you end up to get lower performance. 
you increase the resistance for this reason. And also you start to degrade your battery because you start to make some deposits, some lithium plating, and you also start to increase the dendrite formation. So you understand it's very important to control this uh, temperature very accurately. And so you need to rely on the, uh, the cooling system of your battery. So in uh, uh, this introduction, we have asked you to answer the poll and ask you which uh, battery uh, management you are the most familiar with. I was expecting it would be a water glycol plate, and this is the case. But I am actually surprised to see it's much more diversified than what I thought. And um, it seems that you uh, know and you are familiar with a, a lot of them. But nevertheless, some of you really would like to know more. So for the sake uh, of this presentation, I will briefly introduce these different technologies. Um, so if we start, the first one is air cooled. Air cooled is very simple and easy to implement because first you do not need to put an additional fluent. You just use the air which is available anyway. And this air can enter inside the battery pack or it just can be around the battery pack as it is the case, for example, in the Nissan Leaf. But obviously air is not very good at cooling. It gets uh, limitations. So you have a limited efficiency and uh, if you want to increase this efficiency, you will have to get a higher uh, cooling channel, but this means uh, additional cost and additional weight. A second family is water glycol. This is the most common and actually most of the uh, new EVs that end up in the market today are uh, water cooled. There are a lot of different sub technology in this. So you can get this uh, mixture of water and glycol uh, within small channel in between the cells, as it is the case, for example, in some Tesla. You can get channel underneath uh, your battery pack, uh, or you can get a full uh, metal plate on which you get a small channel in which you will get this uh, water glycol, as it is the case, for example, on the Volkswagen ID3. Uh, the main problem of uh, this technology is the fact that it's very difficult to get a uniform temperature because obviously if you, en if you enter uh, some water which is cold and it's going to heat at it manages the temperature of the cell, it will become hotter and hotter. And at some point you understand uh, the cells at the beginning of this channel are cool, uh, cold, while the cells at the end of this channel are hot. So remember you have this very narrow temperature. So if you are not able to control exactly what's happened, you will disequilibrate the way you deteriorate your battery. And so it's not very good. Another possibility is instead of using a water glycol, you also can cool refrigerant. Uh, this is an option used by BMW, for example, but it's not that common. Uh, globally, it works the same as water glycol, but the difference is that you use a refrigerant instead of just water. You have a um, change of phase possible, and it's very efficient to cool. But the problem is that heating is much more uh, difficult, uh, obviously, because of the technology. And the last technology possible is immersion cooling. So obviously I'm not going to detail everything here because Arnaud is going to make a full presentation about this after me. But I think uh, what is important to mention here is that um, you do not cool only the cell, but you cool everything inside the battery pack, which has the advantage that first you are homogeneous around uh, your cells. But the second main advantage is that you also cool all the electronic, all the bus bar, all the connector, and so on. It is a really cool enabler for some technology, like uh, fast charging. Um, among the drawbacks, we can say uh, that the main problem, I guess, is that uh, immersion cooling is not very well known by people in the industry. So, so far, we have not really seen so much um, EV with uh, immersion cooling. And actually it is used only in high performance one, like uh, for example, Formula One or for 24 hour Le Mans or high performance car like for Rimac or McLaren or the Koenigsegg. Um, before giving uh, the rest of the presentation to Arnaud, I would like to mention something very important for me. Um, most of the time people see battery as a an important uh, system of the EV, but they tend to separate that compared to the EV. It is important for me that people keep in mind the global view of the system and 
Uh, in this, the battery cooling will involve a lot of different components inside the vehicle. So for example, if you take a Porsche Taycan here, you will get, in addition of this cooling system, so the cooling plate, we, you will have a lot of things. You will have condenser, chiller, but you will have also different circuits, which will involve a lot of uh, material, such as different valves, different uh, sensors, because you will have different coolant system. You will have different pump in order to get a low temperature loop, a high temperature loop. You will have a shut off valve and so on. So you understand all of this will add first a lot of weight. So on the battery taken, all of this represent more than 70 kilograms, which is not negligible, I guess. This also mean a lot of cost for the OEM. And in terms of complexity and in terms of calibration, this is a lot of work. So it is something that we need to simplify. An additional thing is that, of course, all these circuits to run need energy. It's not for free. So it means the energy you run this is something not available for the rest of the EV. So if you can save this, you will end up with something much more efficient. So what we want to achieve now is to get a coolant which is efficient, simpler, and safe. And I hope Arnaud can show us what we can achieve now today with immersion cooling uh, for a road car. Thanks a lot, Cecile, for this very good and comprehensive introduction. So yes, I'll try to answer the question now is, is battery immersion cooling going to need to be the next big thing in EVS uh, thermal management? So let's take the different uh, uh, approach. And the first one is to understand the problem or the need for OEMs in the coming years. So <clears throat> thanks to our voice of the customers at TXOS, we noticed that uh, any OEM who wants to provide ultra fast charging in the near future will need to remove at least 12 thermal kilowatts from the car which is not possible today with air cooling or cold plate cooling without damaging the cells. So this is why we bring this immersion cooling technology on the table, because we do think it brings a lot of advantages. Like the charging time, for sure, you can have a 20 to 80% SOC charge within 10 minutes, which means, let's take an example, uh, 60 kilowatt hours being charged within 10 minutes, which represents 300 kilometers or 200 miles. And uh, compared to, yes, the benchmark today is around 30 minutes and most of the cars uh, uh, can charge this, this 20 to 80% in more than 45 minutes. Then you increase by far the power to energy ratio, uh, which is today around 1.5. Uh, we can have far more than three, thanks to immersion cooling, which means that you can have more energy, break energy recovery and more acceleration. Then you have a, a, a safer battery, which is key. Um, you've all heard about what happened to a Hyundai Kia recall of their car. Uh, which cost uh, $900 million, which is a lot. And so safety is really key, not only to protect uh, the passengers naturally, but also uh, for the brand image and uh, to be sure that EV will become a main trend and uh, to reassure the final users. So we've proved at TXOS that we have no thermal runaway propagation if a cell goes uh, into thermal runaway thanks to immersion cooling. And last but not least, this technology is compatible with any kind of cells. What I, what I mean by any kind of cells is whatever the form factor, cylindrical, pouch, or prismatic, and whatever the electrochemistry, NMC, NMCA, LTO, and even for, even for ultra capacitors, this, bring, this brings added value. So uh, let's have a look to the added value per market and for which market this is uh, the most suited. For, for sure, for battery electric vehicle, uh, where the charging time is key, uh, this is a, a very uh, uh, appropriated technology. And uh, naturally for passenger car, but not only for all uh, the industrial vehicles that tomorrow will need to charge in a very short time because charging time is uh, most of the time a loss for uh, uh, the company that exploits uh, this industrial vehicle. Then it is also very suited for very high power hybrids because naturally uh, uh, immersion cooling enables very high C rates, current rates. So for high power hybrids, this makes a lot of sense to use immersion cooling. And this is also good to be coupled with fuel cells because fuel cells need buffer batteries. 
so you understand here that immersion coding could be a, a mainstream and main trend because it addresses uh, nearly all the future markets of electrification. But when we talk about immersion coding, what about the technology and how many types of immersion coding exist as of today? So we at the EXOS have identified six different families of immersion coding, uh, six different architectures. So uh, at the uh, upper left side, it begins with pumped liquid. So you have a liquid that goes through the cells and through the module or through the battery pack. Then you have the spray cooling. The spray cooling is like a jet cooling uh, for which you have a, a spray cooling on the bus bar, uh, which reduces the quantity of fluid. Then you have uh, the pool boiling or vapor chamber. So here you imagine that you have a sealed module in which you have two phase inside liquid and vapor. And then you have a cold source, which can be a water like or cold plate, for example, to remove the heat uh, going outside from the module. It can be also used uh, to remove thermal pad and replace them uh, in a gap filler situation. It is already used uh, as static bath. So in that case, you have no liquid circulation. And uh, the last one is also with two-phase fluids for which you can have pumped two-phase architecture, which means that the, uh, you have liquid in, inside the module, and you have liquid plus vapor outside the module and then you cool this mix of liquid plus vapor at another place in the vehicle. So four of these technologies are suited for what we call single phase cooling. Single phase means basically pure liquids. And three of them are suited for two phase, two phase um, cooling, which means that you have liquid and you can have liquid plus vapor. So you use the latent heat, the vapor latent heat, to cool more efficiently uh, the cells. So uh, what type of fluids can be used in immersion cooling? You have two uh, main families. You have the oils and the fluorinated products. So oils means mineral synthetics or ester oils and fluorinated products means, means HFE, HFO or HFC. And in between you can have, you can have mixed of uh, these two fluids. So either you have mix of oil and fluorinated products or mix of uh, different oils in, uh, in this category. So just basically, let's have a look on the criteria for OEMs to choose and decide which fluid will be the most suited for their applications. Arnaud, sorry to interrupt yes. you, but what do you mean here by fluid mix? Do you mean that both oil and fluorinated are blended together or is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks, Cecile. Yes, uh, they are blended together. Uh, we are not talking about two fluids uh, and two separate loops inside the vehicles. We are talking about a single fluid to cool the battery, which is blended and which is a blend between, for example, oil and fluorinated products. And it can be a blend between several types of oil, of oils, for example, according to Thanks, Cecile, for the question. What are the criteria uh, for which the OEM will uh, decide to move on the one or the other fluid? The cost, naturally, so the cost of oil is, is rather good compared to fluorinated products, but flammability, fluorinated products are, uh, uh, are better. The robustness to pollution is true that, that oils are quite robust, and there are naturally solutions uh, to to be sure that your native products uh, will be also uh, robust uh, thanks to filtration and lots of things. Viscosity, viscosity is better for your native products. Density times specific heat, it's, it's also important. So it's nearly the same here for the two uh, families. And the thermal conductivity, which is quite better for us. So these are very basic criteria for this webinar, but naturally we go far beyond this type of criteria. We have values, we have a lot of data in-house at the XOS. So now let's move uh, to the next topic, which is what is the immersion cooling impact on the system? You have here on this schematic view, an air conditioning system. So uh, the cabin loop with its condenser and evaporator. So it can be either an air conditioning or a heat pump system. And you see the battery on the right side with its PTC heater to preheat uh, the battery during the winter, for example. And you can see in green that we add a second evaporator uh, on the air conditioning system and a low temperature radiator 
on the battery circuit. So this is how this impacts the system. So what about this impact in terms of cost? We've made a lot of study. We have uh, our internal tools that have been validated by several OEMs at TXOS, and we compare the cost of uh, various architectures, various fleets, and various types of cars. So here it is just an extract. The black line represents the uh, coal plate as it is as of today. And uh, we ranked four different technologies, uh, architectures of immersion cooling for two types of cars. Here is just an example, a Peugeot E208 and an Audi e tron And we've made some optimization for these two cars uh, to be sure that the battery pack that we will put in these cars in several years will be cooled with immersion cooling and adapted for immersion cooling. So you can see that with optimization, uh, we managed to decrease the cost compared to uh, the coal plate as it is uh, designed today. And what about the weight? It's the same thing here. We compare, so the black line is still the reference, what are like a coal plate. And you can see that we can be below the reference for uh, several types of architectures in terms of weight uh, as well. Why? Because uh, when you are in immersion cooling, you remove the coal plate, and the coal plate is creativity, you remove the under shield, you remove thermal pads, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so this simplifies a bit the, the battery assembly, and this removes cost and weight if it is properly designed, and this is what we bring to our customers. In terms of order of magnitude, uh, I don't know what, what's uh, the amount of volume you have or kilo you have in, in such a system? Yes, very good question. So let's take the example of battery packs in the range of 60 to 80 kilowatt hours. We target between 20 and 30 liters of fluid to cool the battery. This is for full immersion. Then it can be further optimized probably with a spray or jet cooling. So this is the order of magnitude that we can share with you. All right, so let's move to uh, the next one. Uh, and next topic uh, will be uh, what are the key criteria to ensure the success of this technology for a mass market application? Naturally, cost, because yeah, uh, a lot of industries are uh, cost driven, and this is the case for the Pascals. And so when we are talking about costs, there are several types of costs, the research and development costs, system and fruit costs at the system level uh, when it will be produced, so the assembly costs accordingly, and maintenance and aftermarket costs. Then you have to be very, very careful on the technology robustness, so you need to ensure the dielectric properties along the battery lifetime to ensure that you will have no free leaks and that the system properties will be uh, suitable with extreme conditions. You know that OEMs, they sell their vehicles, whatever the industry, it can be the past car industry or the construction equipment industry, they sell their vehicle in very hot or very cold environments. So you need to ensure that this technology is suited for this type of environments. The system impacts, how it will impact the, the system, the cooling loop integration, and is it possible to get a unique fluid to cool the battery, the power electronics, and the motors? These are activities that we performed, and uh, it's really uh, very, very interesting to see uh, that you can get a lot of added value here. Then the benefits, you need to ensure that you have the benefits, so it is linked to the system robustness, but prior to that, you need to be sure that you can ensure the ultra-fast charging, uh, in, um, in during all the lifetime of the vehicle, so with a lot of ultra-fast charging along the, the, the lifetime of the vehicle. You need to ensure safety under a lot of various types of condition and safety. There are many types of uh, safety tests, abuse tests here. And um, we also need to prove the longer lifetime of the battery because we have a better temp cell temperature homogeneity. And naturally, this has a, a good positive impact on the battery lifetime, and this has to be properly proved. Environmental impact, naturally, we add a fluid, and a, with, yes, as I, as I mentioned, 20 or 30 liters of fluid inside the battery pack. So, in, ca in case of fluid breakdown after thermal runaway or fluid leaks uh, or life cycle analysis, you need to uh, properly assess all these uh, uh, things linked to the fluid that we bring into the battery. So, XOS brings a lot of added value on these five criteria. And there is a sixth one, which is the supply chain. Naturally, the fluid 
will need the, will be needed to be available wherever the customers are and customers are firstly where, wherever the cars will be produced or the vehicle will be produced but naturally wherever the uh, aftermarket uh, will be needed so now let's have a look uh, we call it speak with data because all that I presented previously was a bit of theory, and now we'll have a deeper look inside the uh, concrete things that we have behind and the concrete data that we generate on a day-to-day -day basis at the Atlas. So the first thing that we are being asked by our customers is naturally to provide relevant prototypes. And this is really tricky because most of our customers, they want to assess several cooling types for example, full immersion, immersion spray cooling, two-phase cooling, with sometimes several types of cells. You can see that some OEMs, they have, uh, for example, for PHEV, a cell from factor, a given cell, and for BV, another type of cell. Uh, and so this is really tricky because they want to assess technology for various types of cells and module architecture. And then you need to ensure that the test benches that will test this relevant prototype that have been designed are also um, representative in terms of uh, conditions uh, and test conditions, because as you probably know, there are no standards for immersion cooling technology today. So we have to invent them. So this is what we bring to our customers, process methodology on how to test immersion cooling despite the lack of standards as of today. And so if you look at all the possible combinations, you have millions of possible combinations. And most of the time, we are also asked to compare immersion cooling to water like or cold plates. And the cold, plate, cold plates are today designed for complete battery packs. So we have been designing our uh, own cold plate design for modules uh, because we test most of the time at the module level first before moving to the complete battery packs. So everything you see here, we provide it at, uh, at Exos. So, uh, in terms of tests and test results, how does it look like? What are the data that we can generate? So, here before moving to this session, I'd like to thank a lot uh, some of our customers that authorize us to communicate these results uh, that you will see in the following slides. So, this is the first example of tested that we performed with the company BP. And uh, the test that we've made here was really severe. So, we had uh, an even minute charge followed by three WLTC cycles. And we begin with an initial temperature, temperature of the cell of 40 degrees Celsius, which is called uh, high, and an ambient temperature of 40 degrees Celsius accordingly. So these are very, very severe conditions. And we proved together with, with the company BP that we were capable of successfully charging within 75% uh, of SOC within 11 minutes with uh, no more than 15 degrees Celsius added in the battery pack. And the range, so the, the battery average temperature were, were always under 55 degrees Celsius. And the cell temperature range were within plus minus three degrees Celsius for a 4C for those who are uh, accustomed with the C rate, it was a four C charging time, which is uh, really, really uh, impressive here. Arno, so, yes, so, sorry to interrupt again, but you say this is on um, test ring, and here you mentioned yes. you have WLTC cycles. So does it mean it's on Filtria or? Yeah, thanks for the question again. Yeah, uh, we have we are we have the capability at the Exos to generate and to do representative cycles at the bench level. We have uh, power cycles. Uh, and so we have our own cycles uh, developed on our own, but we uh, can also play any types of cycles uh, that comes from our customers. If you want to play uh, US06, for example, or whatever the, the, the cycle, we can play them uh, thanks to our power supply uh, that we code internally. So. Yes, this is at the bench level. We always begin at the bench level before moving, moving to the complete battery pack and vehicle integration, which will be the next steps. Another type of data generated, so this, this work with the company Fuchs. Fuchs asks us uh, to help them to select the best thread to improve the heat transfer. So you can see on this graph that we generate data 
uh, on the uh, on this axis, you have the pumping power versus the uh, heat capacity, uh, heat capacity flow. And so we proved and uh, selected the fluid that has the best, uh, um, yes, the best results uh, for these two parameters of pumping power, which needs to be reduced, and heat capacity flow, which needs to be increased. And so we proved also that some of the fluids can have a, a temperature effect or um, some uh, uh, temperature effects, and some other have no temperature effects, which was really interesting for us also to discover that uh, phenomenon. So why is it important to reduce the pumping pumping work? Because if you reduce the pumping work, you will have a smaller pump, so a smaller weight and smaller cost. And you will also have a smaller con a consumption, which means uh, that we'll have a better range, uh, better autonomy of the vehicle. Then we generated uh, some tests on additives together with the company Arkima. And in that case, we proved that we have uh, an increase of plus 20% in the performance of uh, the heat transfer coefficient. So the graph that is shown here is heat transfer coefficient versus heat flux. And so for the same pump consumption, we prove that you, you can get plus 20% of uh, heat transfer coefficient thanks to the additive of the company Arkina, which is very interesting because uh, there are, let's call them base fluids. Uh, like oils and fluorinated products, but here it's an additive which can bring uh, which can bring added value also to uh, uh, base fluids. And last but not least, with the company Chemos, we've performed some thermal runaway abuse tests, so nail penetration tests in that case. So it was performed on cylindrical uh, on eight cylindrical uh, uh, module cells. Uh, but naturally, we do at EXOS nail penetration or abuse tests, generally speaking, on prismatic and pouch automotive cells. So here the example is with Pendrico, but we do uh, other types of uh, tests on different types of cell form factors. You can see here that, so you have the temperature, the average temperature for this uh, batch module. And you can see that uh, the black line is cooled with air and you have after less than three minutes, so the time is here in seconds, so you have less after less than three minutes, a complete propagation of the thermal runaway. And with the two other fluids of the customer, the uh, average temperature remain after 50 seconds below 80 degrees Celsius and we have no thermal runaway propagation, which is a very good result. So uh, this is also a very key feature for immersion cooling, not only the charging time and the performances are improved, but also the safety is by far improved compared to other types of uh, cooling technologies. All right, so now uh, let's have a brief overview before moving to your question of the company EXOS, and I will benefit from this webinar. Uh, to make an announcement in three slides. So <laughs> stay tuned if you want to know more. ExoS, CXOS is a company dedicated, fully dedicated to advanced thermal system solutions. So what does it mean? It means that we develop a lot of knowledge, uh, not only on immersion cooling, but on the complete system, systems like heat pumps. Uh, we have a lot of background on waste heat recovery, and uh, we are moving more and more towards power electronic cooling,s uh, e-motor cooling,s and so. So, with a focus on immersion cooling, which is the topic of today, what do we provide? So, you can see our uniqueness here. Uh, I guess we have one of the unique fluid expertise. So, how to use a fluid in, in the battery application? We have OEMs approved prototypes, relevant prototypes, and we have uh, 11 customers on immersion cooling. What do we provide to our customers? Material compatibility, uh, under voltage. So we have tests with fluids, but uh, they are under voltage and with pollutants to see how they react, how stable they are. We provide uh, a lot of module designs for cylindrical, prismatic, or pouch cells and whatever the electrochemistry. We provide performance, aging, and abuse tests. And all these test bench you see are uh, in-house at EXOS. A lot of uh, job on the fluid de definition. One of our uniqueness is also to provide correlated simulation. Because we have the data, we are capable of providing uh, 
uh, simulation in which we have our data, which is really key uh, to avoid mistakes. And last but not least, we have a lot of uh, ongoing system developments and bench manufacturing. And we have more than that because we created to, together with the company StarTech Development a joint venture called Immersive. And StarTech is specialized in uh, battery packs and battery management system. And uh, that's why uh, an Immersive is uh, manufacturing battery packs, submerged battery packs. And that's why we estimate that the XOS is an industrial company that talks to industrial because naturally we face same uh, challenges than our customers who develop battery packs because we are developing our own battery packs in this GD. So a brief word about Immersive on one slide. Immersive manufactures submerged battery packs only. It's a joint venture of 50-50 between EXOS and StarTech development. We have several battery packs under development and we target racing, industrial vehicles, and mass market Pascal markets with uh, through partnerships at the end of the day. The first battery pack that we have uh, is for racing application. Uh, it's called FIRST, and it provides very high C rates in charge and discharge. Namely, we, we can get 7C continuously, and uh, peak, uh, peak charging rate is uh, 10C. Peak uh, C rate, sorry, is 10C. And we have uh, another battery pack under development, which is uh, dedicated for ultra fast charging with high energy density. So this first one is with cylindrical cell. The second one is with prismatic automotive cells. So it is dedicated to various types of uh, uh, markets, as you can see on this slide. So if you want to know more, please feel free to contact me after this, uh, this webinar. So you see here our roadmap, and that's our that's my last slide before the, the conclusion and then the Q and A. So Exos is uh, uh, accelerating a lot on battery cooling and especially on battery immersion cooling. Uh, Exos is a fast growing company with double digit uh, every year. We have a lot of activities also on the at the system level, heat pumps or air conditioning system. And we are launching a new activity, which is to provide uh, test benches dedicated to immersion cooling. What does it mean? It means that we have unique chillers with mass flow control. We have fluid dioelectric properties control, fluid transfer and filtration, and so on. So as we operate in-house our own test bench, we do believe that uh, we have a very good offer to sell our test bench to external companies, to our customers. Then, as mentioned, we are uh, increasing our footprints in power electronic cooling, as well as in e-motor cooling before the end of this year. And next year, we, have, we want to have a foot in hydrogen. We have several discussion in parallel on this topic. All right, so yes, this slide is, uh, uh, I will go very quickly through that. You can find more information on our new website and we, you will find uh, dedicated information on battery machine cooling. So feel free to uh, have a look to this website and stay tuned on LinkedIn in which we uh, reveal uh, very uh, frequently a lot of information. So my conclusion is that uh, for us, immersion cooling is, has really the DNA to become mainstream and mass market. It is, thanks to our knowledge, possible, even if there are still changes, but it is possible to get a single fluid to cool the battery, the power electronics, and the motors, which will simplify a lot the architectures and the vehicle integration. The early adopters are already here. There are niche markets today in 2021, but you can find submerged battery packs in a racing application, uh, Formula One, for example. You can find them in buses in London, or you can find them also in luxury cars, as uh, Cecil mentioned in, uh, in her introduction, like the McLaren Speedtail, for example. So these products are already on the road. So we are not dreaming anymore about a future market. This is already existing. So if you are an OEM, fluid maker, or a tier one, uh, please feel free to contact us and uh, we uh, will try to accelerate your development thanks to our uh, very strong background in immersion. So now I'd like to uh, thank you, all of you, uh, and thanks Cecile again for uh, having ha accepting my invitation to uh, take part to this webinar. You, are, you have our uh, information here on this slide and I will let this slide during the uh, Q&A session so that you can have the time to, uh, 
to have this information. And don't worry, uh, you will have the video available after this webinar uh, if something is missing or if you were late <laughs> to join the webinar. So please now, I will let I will introduce now uh, my co-founder on EXOS uh, and our CTO, Rémi Dacor, who will lead the, the uh, Q&A session and who will try to make the choice between the numerous questions that we see on the screen. So please, Rémi, the floor is, you, is yours if you can uh, begin with the first question. Yes, Arno, we received uh, nearly more than 50 questions. <laughs> Uh, so I will I will uh, maybe raise the first question for Cécile, so that you can uh, have a brief, Arno. Thanks, Arno. <laughs> um, Cécile, maybe you can help me answer this question. Um, can you explain us uh, which role does battery cooling play in limiting charging speed? Is, there, is this the, the only limit of charging speed? And a second question uh, in a row, uh, why immersion cooling is not commonly used in the street EVs uh, yet? because of price maybe? Um, so I will start with the, the last part of the question. I think immersion cooling is not used for the reason that we are still at the beginning of EV anyway. Even if we start to see a lot of things, we can say that EV are still at the, at the start. And immersion cooling is not very well known at this moment. Uh, actually, this presentation is in my opinion, the really best that can be done today. And um, I think it, when people will really see and understand much more how they can use this uh, technology, benefits they have, uh, prices that, that will reduce and so on, we will see this technology to, to raising. So I, I just see that the limiting factor at this moment is the understanding of the technology. And um, yes, maybe not maturity, but really understanding because it's really new. Uh, in terms of uh, the first part of the question for charging, everything that will charge or discharge stress the battery anyway. So it, it can degrade it. It can, uh, yes, it can age the battery more quickly. So you absolutely need in, in this moment to manage the temperature very accurately. And obviously uh, the best you can manage the temperature, the best it is. So of course, uh, immersion here get a benefit. Uh, the cooling plate and the water cooling gets the same uh, drawback as when you use the battery anyway, it just means that you are not uniform. And if you are not uniform, maybe some of your cells are going to be really hot and aged, while the rest of the battery is fine. But if one of your battery aged too much, then you deteriorate your battery globally, so it's not good. Yeah, maybe I can add a comment on that. Thanks a lot, Cecile. It's also because uh, nowadays uh, it's hard to find energy cells that, are, that accept high charging rates uh, for the charging uh, uh, situation. So it's also true to admit that uh, these type of cells will come in the two or three years from now and you have a, uh, a lot of announcements for the very big players that cells uh, tomorrow will accept 4C, 5C, 6C, which is not really the case today. It's hard to find energy cells that accept high power charging uh, rates. Uh, so this is also linked to the uh, cell as of it is today. So that's why you don't see them in the street also. <clears throat> okay, I've got a bit of technical question I don't know for you. Um, can you explain us more how we, we should visualize immersion cooling? What is it? Is it, is it really a, a bath in which the cell and electronics are embedded? Or uh, are the liquids containing bags and channels? Can, can you explain how it works in a few words? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, there, there are there are, so there are six families of immersion cooling. But let's forget the static bath. It can be a bath, but then the uh, heat transfer coefficient, or let's say the efficiency of the cooling efficiency to remove heat, is not that high. So uh, uh, what we like most is to have the fluid circulating uh, to remove the heat from the battery to the front radiator. So yes, it will be. Um, you will have some pipes. It, for me, it will be the same as a water glycol coal plate. So you need a pump, you need pipes. Uh, the difference is that instead of being outside of the module, uh, it will be inside of the module. Uh, that's why we call it not only immersion cooling, but also direct cooling, because the fluid will be in direct contact with the cells. And not only, it will be in direct contact with the bus bar and so on. So you will have, to, to answer properly the question, you will have an in and out so hydraulic connectors at the module level, and then module will be connected together and you will have 
pipes and hose that goes out from the battery, in the battery and out of the battery with a pump in between and naturally a front radiator to cool the fluid. Good. And, and now that, that you explained that, we have a lot of questions on um, what is this fluid? It seems to be a, a magic fluid that can go uh, in direct contact with the life parts. What, what, what the property requirements for this fluid? The electric, yeah. viscosity, etc. Can you explain us a bit? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, naturally, the main parameter is the dielectric properties, because if the fluid is not dielectric, then you have uh, several problems, possible problems. Uh, some are uh, only self-discharging battery, but uh, none of you wants uh, <laughs> in the morning uh, to uh, try to get somewhere with an empty battery because uh, it has self-discharged during the night. So it's it's already a huge problem. But then you can get more than that. If the fluid is conductive, you can have a battery fire, which is uh, uh, no way. Uh, so the first parameter that needs to, that the fluid needs to uh, ensure is naturally the dielectric properties along the time. So the fluid needs to be always dielectric. Then uh, the other one will be the viscosity. As you have, as mentioned, 20, 30 liters of fluid inside the battery, you need to move these 20 or 30 liters with a pump. And so the higher the viscosity, the harder will it be for the pump to move that, or uh, the uh, bigger will be the pump. And then uh, the, the cost will be uh, quite important. And for, for example, for low temperature, you can even have uh, liquids that transform into foam uh, that cannot move anymore. So viscosity will be uh, also a key parameter. So dielectric properties, viscosity, and then uh, everything around safety, naturally. So uh, you have like the flash point uh, at which temperature the fluid uh, auto uh, ignites, uh, and, and lots of criteria. But uh, I, I guess I cannot go uh, much more into details. Uh, contact maybe, us if you want more, more information. Yes, maybe one point on about lots yeah. of question about sustainability, DWP, sure. recyclability of this fluid. Yeah, is, it, is, it, is it is it is uh, it worth? We, we are doing clean mobility, and is it worth uh, adding a, a fluid that may harm the environment? Sure, this is a key topic, and we are very very careful about that. Uh, we try to also advise uh, our uh, OEM customers. Uh, on this topic, but they, they don't need us. They already know that uh, they, they will need to provide real green products uh, in the field. So yes, for sure, there are two or oh, there are several strategies. So if the fluids are fluorinated products, naturally they are very low GWP to be candidates for battery cooling. So today we talk about 150. Uh, this is a GWP index for the air conditioning system. So all the fluids needs to be below. 150, and some of the best fluids uh, we tested are at one or two uh, for the index of GWT, so far below 150. Uh, so this is for fluorinated. And then for oils, you have several strategies. So uh, you have uh, uh, fluid makers that biosource their oil, that mix uh, their oils with esters or use uh, pure esters, uh, if they are green esters, or uh, that work on uh, re reusability of the fluids. So some fluids, uh, after eight years in a battery pack, will be able only with uh, filtration to be reused, and some of them for uh, many, many uh, decades. So uh, yes, this topic is uh, uh, utmost important, and naturally we trigger it with our customers and we have a dedicated uh, a work package on this, uh, let's call it life cycle analysis. So the complete, the global picture from the very beginning to the end of the battery lifetime. Okay, uh, maybe a question for you, Cecile, um, about the system. Um, would it, do you think it would be possible to cool all uh, Ancillaries of, of a car with a single fluid, with a single dielectric oil, for example, and and always everybody knows that water is, a, is the best heat carrier. Uh, will it lead to some compromise or trade-off for for cooling e-motors, electronics with uh, oil? Um, can, can you answer that? So 
if I take my experience from uh, internal combustion engine, I would say no for the reasons that you will always end up with debris, you will always end up with things that need to be compatible with the material and so on. So I think maybe, maybe I don't know enough to answer really this question, but I personally, I don't believe it would be so easy to make only one circuit with everything. Also, because you will have to manage the aging of all of this. Um, another thing I want to mention is that water maybe seems fine like that, but water is not the best candidate for sure. Um, there are much more better things than water. Also because water means corrosion in general. Okay. Um, I know we have a lot of questions about the, the free mix, the blends that you mentioned about oil and fluorinated. Are they miscible? Can we play on... Um, I've got a question which is not on the QNR tab, but it was about the boiling temperature. Can we use that to stop thermal runaway propagation? Um, damage risks uh, related to the changing phase, uh, critical boiling side effects. Lots of things about boiling. Uh, can you give us a, a bit uh, a word yeah, about so, fluid mix yeah. and boiling? <laughs> this is a, a very sensitive, uh, 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 these are very sensitive information that uh, belongs to, to some of our customers. So here the answer is yes, if we, uh, uh, if we work on additive, it's because they provide added value for sure, as you can imagine. We can just answer that, okay, it can, uh, it can ease um, or increase the flash point, for example, or uh, improve the uh, performance of oil for low temperature uh, and uh, especially the viscosity. So if you are at minus 30 degrees Celsius, minus 20, 30, minus degree, 20 degrees Celsius, sorry. Yes, you can imagine that this type of additives can bring a lot of value, but then, okay, uh, let's, let's have a direct chat on this uh, under NDAs. Thanks. Maybe uh, a basic question, but maybe we forgot to address it. What about the power requirements for, for battery cooling? Uh, can you give us a word about the, the, the quantity of energy, of heat that should be removed for the battery for, uh, during fast charging, for example? Yes, as, as mentioned, it's, it's, it will be uh, more than 12 thermal kilowatts in the future. So today uh, it's around three thermal kilowatts uh, with water glycol cooling and uh, let's say uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, fast charging. And tomorrow, uh, if we target to charge within 10 minutes, uh, this will lead to at least 12 thermal kilowatts and not counting in that uh, the cooling of the cabin because uh, you can imagine that the, the battery will heat a lot and so uh, you don't want the, uh, the conductor of the car. You don't want people in the car uh, to have like 30 degrees Celsius in the car. So you need to cool also the, the, the car, which adds probably uh, four kilowatts. So on average, uh, ultra fast charging will probably require, require to generate uh, 15, 16, 20 uh, thermal kilowatts uh, and two, yes, um, 75% of uh, this value will be needed to cool the battery and to remove the heat of the battery and 25% to cool the cabin. Okay, thank you. Um, a few questions about the extra weight and costs. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, mesh, can immersion cooling be competitive to the current uh, water plates, water, water glycol cooling plates uh, designs in terms of weight and costs? I let you directly answer, Remy. <laughs> you are the one. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I, I can give a word on that. And um, uh, typically, it really depends on on the battery uh, design. But currently, battery batteries are, are first not that optimized because it's really uh, not much technology, uh, and um, they are optimized uh, to to be cooled by cold plates. So. When we now work on uh, battery optimization for immersion cooling, uh, for sure, uh, that will be competitive for a weight and cost uh, point of view. And, and here we can bring uh, weight savings and even cost savings with a better performances. So this is why in, in our view at EXOS, we, we truly believe that uh, immersion, te immersion cooling technique will, uh, will, will be on the market soon for this uh, cost reduction. Uh, and weight reduction. 
and 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 uh, lots of questions, but maybe it's hard to answer. It's about a lifetime, lifetime of the free, lifetime of the battery of the battery. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we can we can just yeah we we can answer that naturally. A lifetime uh, takes a long way to uh, to be proved uh, because we are talking about eight or ten years. Uh, targeted lifetime for the, for a battery pack. So what we do at TXOS is that we do uh, accelerated tests, uh, uh, 24 hours, seven on fully automated test benches uh, to provide answers on aging. And we have several types of tests on aging. We have tests uh, in autoclaves with fluids and uh, pollution and uh, lots of, uh, let's say, uh, materials that are in the autoclaves. And these are special autoclaves that we developed in-house. Uh, with uh, currents, uh, with um, uh, power electronics that supply currents in, inside the autoclaves. So we have the, the uh, yeah, it's, it's really representative of uh, what will happen for the fluid inside a module. And then we have other types of aging. We have uh, aging at the module level, 20, 24 hours, seven. And uh, uh, at the module level, we have uh, uh, defined uh, specific cycles and spe specific methodologies. And here we are, we are talking about uh, several months program for aging, uh, because this is linked also to the maturity. And the, the more the maturity will increase, the more these aging tests will, uh, aging test length will also increase. So yes, we have plenty of uh, aging test possibilities in-house uh, and we build them together with our customers. Uh, but naturally the calendar aging needs uh, the calendar time. So uh, uh, this this is not always compatible with uh, uh, several months testing. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now we raise up to 80 questions. So for sure we will not be able, we will not be able to answer all of this. Um, uh, all the questions that are related to um, scientific papers or um, three characteristics, maybe uh, we can uh, ask people to directly go on our website and download uh, some scientific papers that are uh, available on, directly on the website. Uh, here you, you will be able to find um, results uh, about uh, uh, battery testing, uh, dummy cells testing, uh, you will find three characteristics on this paper that you can download on our website. Yeah, simulation as well. Yeah, yeah there is a few questions about simulation. It was uh, my point, uh, my next point. Um, I just, I cannot find it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, were, were we able to perform simulation and validation for two-phase fluid? How do we do we do that uh, simulation? Uh, maybe I, I can answer, Arno, if you yes, agree. Yes, yes. Um, so yes, we, we have um, dedicated simulation activity on immersion cooling. So first of all, uh, the, our first uh, um, work were to, to develop uh, a, battery, a, a reliable battery cell model. So for that, uh, we, um, we are using several types of, of software from, from MATLAB to uh, gamma technology software or even SOLIDWORKS software where we, where we tear down cells and developed a detailed cell model. Uh, on top of that, we now add um, a cooling model based on the, on the real data uh, coming from our tests where we were able to calibrate some uh, some um, heat transfer coefficient uh, calibrations uh, in order to, uh, to, to simulate uh, the cooling, uh, various type of cooling architecture, uh, where we now are able to simulate uh, pump liquids, uh, spray cooling, jet cooling, and also two-phase cooling. So two-phase cooling, we made a lot of work uh, with um, with various type of, of fluid for batteries, but not only for also for power electronics cooling in, in immersion with two-phase fluids, uh, where we calibrate the heat transfer coefficients of, of this. Um, and there's lots of uh, parameters uh, to be able to calibrate accurately, uh, surface roughness, uh, pressure for sure, temperature, but we, we also have lots of uh, fluid segregation when we have uh, fluid mixtures all of this can be simulated 
Yes, Remy, sorry to interrupt, but we have only 30 seconds yes. remaining. So uh, I'd like to, so thanks for your for your answer, Remy. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of you, to thank again Cecile uh, Latimwell for, for their help in this uh, webinar preparation. I would also like to notice that we were more than 400 for this first webinar of the Exodus, which is a real success. So I really thank all of you. We are still 215 nearly, uh, which is very, very uh, promising and which shows how this technology is interesting in the industry, in the entire industry. And uh, that will be my, my last word. Yes, we do think that immersion green will become a, a very, very important topic uh, in the coming months and years. Thanks all of you. We'll try to answer your question afterwards by email directly if you are registered on the platform. And you will find the video uh, in uh, the two coming weeks, a video uh, of this webinar that we are registered. So let's uh, stay tuned on LinkedIn. Uh, please visit our website if you want to know more and uh, download our uh, public and scientific uh, papers. And have a, a good evening for those in Europe and uh, a good day for those uh, based in the US. Bye bye. Don't hesitate to be in touch, everyone. Uh -huh. Thank you for inviting me, Arnaud. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye, Cecile.